Welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries. I'm David Lizabram, here with my co-host, Andrew Keats. And uh, we're joined here by very special guest, Andy Zaleski. Say hi, Andy. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we've got a, uh, a bit of a hybrid episode, um, and that is because um, any, uh, we, well, those of us who, those of you who listen to uh, our guest episodes before know that we always allow our guests to choose the uh, documentary they're going to talk about. So Annie has selected Erg with an exclamation point, A Music War. This is, there's a lot of doc, rock docs with an exclamation point, but this one may be our first one that we're discussing where the, er, the exclamation point is in the middle of the name. Um, from 1981, uh, directed by Chris um, Mukarbel. Uh, I'm sorry, no, directed by Derek Burbage. Um, but uh, Annie also has a book out uh, or coming out about Lady Gaga. So maybe mm-hmm. we'll uh, touch a little bit on that and the, um, the Lady Gaga documentary. Uh, Five foot two from Netflix from a few years ago. So, any, um, let's get into the uh, the Lady Gaga bit first. How did you come to be writing a book about her? So, there is a publisher in the UK called um, Palazzo Editions that actually reached out to me, and they've put out these they put out these kind of illustrated biographies, basically with um, you know writing on different bands. Like they just had one come out on ABBA and the Velvet Underground. And basically they're like, we're looking for someone to write a book on Lady Gaga. And I've written about her in the past and followed her entire career. And so I kind of have a background in doing that. And so that's basically it. So do you have kind of like a a take or a thesis for the book or is it, um, you know, just kind of uh, giving her story to accompany the photos or what's kind of, what are we looking at here? I mean, you know, if there is a thesis, it's, it's it's a lot of kind of her biography and her, you know, story and her career from her music to philanthropy to fashion to um, movies. But it, it's also kind of looking at her as an artist and, you know, why her music stands out and why she's kind of such a unique pop star and why she has a very unique sort of position within kind of the pop realm, I guess you would say. Um, so, you know, kind of within the book, it's all kind of like wrapped in together. Um, well, we can talk a little bit about the, uh, documentary Gaga five foot two directed. That was the one directed mm-hmm. by Chris Morcabell from 2017. Um, this is kind of like the artist authorized, uh, biography. Andrew, what did you call it the other day? Sponcon. Uh, Sponcon, right. <laughs> Sponsored content, um, kind of thing. What, um, was that something you, Annie, you looked at when you were kind of putting this together? Are you familiar with it? I did. Yeah. That was one of the things that I watched in terms of, you know, informing my book. And it's funny you say it's SponCon because I feel like out of a lot of the documentaries that has like kind of artist involvement, this one definitely is a lot rawer than maybe than some other ones. Um, You know, you definitely kind of get behind the scenes of what she deals with on a daily basis. She really kind of goes into the health issues she has and just kind of the hard work that goes into kind of being Lady Gaga and also putting on the show she does. You know, it's not one of those stories and, you know, documentaries that kind of whitewashes, you know, uh, what's going on. Because you, I mean, I don't need to tell you that I'm sure you've seen a million of those where you're like, is, is that what really happened? I know there's a lot of the story that you're actually not mentioning and you can, it's very obvious. Um, but I was very impressed by how kind of vulnerable this was. And, you know, and sort of her, her willingness to be vulnerable and, and open is a big part of who she is as an artist and her, um, her relationship with her fans is I think tied into that and, um, has been since she came through is she, she's had this mm-hmm. deep, um, you know, relationship with, with them and, and people, you know, you see her fans weep feeling like they have this connection with her, um, that, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure she's not the first person to have, to make people feel that way, but I think she certainly, um, is it's it's fairly unusual, I would say. Um, you know what what did you get into any? I imagine you got into a lot of that in your book, but did you did you pick up any uh, particular insights in into who she is as a person to sort of uh, generate that relationship? You know, it's interesting because I think, especially this documentary, I think family is one of those things. Um, you know, there's some scenes in the documentary where because it, it was kind of tied to her album Joanne, 
which is has deep family ties. Um, you know, she had a relative uh, basically uh, named Joanne who died, you know, uh, way before she was born. Um, and, you know, her middle name is also Joanne. And so there's but there's scenes where she's like visiting her family and, you know, and it's very emotional. It's very deep. And, you know, she's Italian. So they're a very emotional family, too, you know. And so you really kind of get the sense of where she came from because and, and kind of just shows how that kind of shaped her. I think this documentary shows a lot of that. Um, you know, I, I think just the fact that she because she has fibromyalgia and lives with that. And I think just in terms of, you know, what it takes for her to get treatment for that and then also kind of be an entertainer uh, with, with such a painful condition as well. Um, you really get a sense of why she's so willing to be open and why she's so empathetic. I mean, I think that's beyond being vulnerable. She's also very empathetic. And I think that's also really kind of separates her from a lot of other pop stars as well. Yeah, I think one of the scenes that I like most in the movie in terms of the family element is there's a scene kind of early in the movie where um, she she attends the baptism of some, you know, baby relative. I don't remember exactly who it is. Um, but you see, like, her parents are there and things like that. And it's just really beautifully shot. And it's everybody looks like, I mean, other than her, like, you know, because she's so famous. But everybody more or less looks like a normal person. And yet, somehow, it, the the... It because of the way it's filmed, or just because of the milieu, it looks like like it could have been a scene from a Scorsese movie about a you know mm-hmm. east northeastern uh, Italian family uh, uh you know Catholic event. Um, it, you know it's just sort of like somehow she's able to. It goes to I guess maybe her being an artist, a visual artist, or something like she, she's able to somehow create <laughs> almost just because of her presence a, an elevated artistic vibe to just what would otherwise be a normal. You know, not that a baptism is not a big deal, but, you know, a, a, a pretty uh, a type of family event that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that was just everybody kind of was on their best behavior and put on their best suit because it was going to be filmed in this Lady Gaga documentary. But it is pretty striking. It is. And I think that that's why I think this documentary also really stood out is that you know, obviously it was kind of chronicling making a record and these family moments, but it was really beautifully shot and it was just really um uh, you know, the way they, they, there was a lot of care kind of put into that to make something like that so ordinary and kind of elevate it. And, you know, then that really stood out to me as well. Yeah, it doesn't have that much of a narrative in terms of like, I wouldn't say that as a character, Lady Gaga in this movie has a clear arc. Like, you know, where uh, there she deals with problems, but it's not like, okay, you're not sure that she's gonna be able to make this movie, this, 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 uh, this, this song or, or this album or something, you know, it's like the album just shows up fully formed, you know, it, you know, she's going to be in the Super Bowl and that comes out and then she performs. It's not like, you know, the, the, there's a real question about what's going to mm-hmm. happen. But um, so you just it's really more just like these moments in her life and, and what she goes through to kind of get to those points. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you did. Did you I, I have to I have to ask since I'm I'm. I'm I have a few friends will be furious if I don't. Do you have any insights for me in um, her appearance in the television program, The Sopranos? I do. She wasn't on The Sopranos that I know of. Um, she is. I, she is very, she, very briefly. Is she? she so that she's, it's funny. She's that, friends that, with AJ, right? Yes. See, that's funny because that did not come up in my in my research, which is interesting yeah. because every like little bit of every little thing that she's done from like, you know, I was, you know, before I was famous, you know, it's kind of like how Kesha was on like the simple life before like anyone knew who Kesha was that did not come up actually. So I do not have any insights, unfortunately. Is it the the scene when, when AJ and his friends are throwing the stuff in the pool um, at the the school and she's like one of the random girls, like sitting on the bleachers laughing. Yeah. She's a teenage. She's an extra. She's yeah. She's a a teenage girl who's in the school. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) I admit that I've actually, not relevant to no. I have actually not seen the Sopranos just because I'm not okay. the biggest fan of kind of like violence and that stuff either and so even though I know obviously the, the Sopranos are amazing um I know that but I've actually never seen the Sopranos either so had I yeah. seen I mean, the Sopranos she's... I probably would have been like that looks familiar yeah I mean she's an Italian teenager from the the tri-state area I'm yeah. sure like her her path to to being an extra I think all Italian teenagers or 20 somethings were sub- it, th- from the tri state area in the early 2000s made at least one appearance in Sopranos. And, <laughs> she and so she, she's no time. different. 
she was very very young i'm just i'm just yeah. seeing this now yeah yeah. Um, and there's going to be a Sopranos connection uh, with Erg as well. So just prepare yourself. I'm gonna, <laughs> Andy and I are obsessed with the Sopranos. So somehow we're going to, you know, it's like that or The Wire or something uh, you're going to shoehorn in. You're talking to two uh, middle aged dudes. So, you know, it's, <laughs> we're not trying to, re- you know, we're, we're trying to stick to our, our, our core thing here. Um, so, okay. So, what, in, you know, we kind of discussed the movie and kind of the look of it yeah. in the arc. Is there, was there any other elements of this movie that you think really stood out or, or, or are illuminating for people who are kind of fans of her? I mean, I think, you know, for if, if people aren't fans of her, I think that it's a movie that if you, you watch it, you come away at least impressed by her and like kind of what she's doing. Cause, you know, even if her music is not your thing, you know, it's it's hard not to watch this and be like, wow, she works hard and she is involved in every step of the way, every inch of her career. You know, I think a lot of people, when they get to a certain point, you know, they have to delegate everything. And she was like, no, I want to make sure that this is right. And everything is, you know, everything works. Um, and I mean, my God, doing a Super Bowl halftime show, that is not easy. And, you know, the fact that it came off so well, too, like, you know, it, it's hard not to just at least, you know, have respect for her just you know for all of that basically mm-hmm. i think i feel like lady gaga maybe i'm being overly generous here to the 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 critical world but i feel like she has somehow managed to avoid some of the pat things that people say to diminish female pop stars um that that sort of from a certain group of uh of people are are more apt to recognize her as the talented uh you know self-driven artist that she is than they are with um you know i i don't know which contemporary katie perry or something like that um that that you know she, she sort of um manages to elude some of the sort of cliched criticisms of being uh industry plants or whatever all uh, surface people, yeah the all surface mm-hmm. thing I, I, like i i, I you know, I, I have I have no data to back up this observation, but 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 it does it does seem to me that she has more uh, more of a, a broad critical recognition of her talent than than often uh, young female pop mm-hmm. stars receive from I think sort of the the male press and the male critical community. You know, I think that's evolved, I think, over time, Um, you know, I think especially early on, you know, she was kind of, you know, viewed as a lot of, you know, just another pop star, just because, you know, the time she came out, you know, the kind of music she was making was a little bit more, you know, cued toward the EDM dance music style stuff. I mean, like just dance. Poker face. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, people appreciated the, the videos and the music, but she was so over the top and she was so different. There was a little bit of like, how can you have a career? Um, you know, and, you know, and obviously when, when born this way came out, you know, there were a lot of Madonna comparisons and there were a lot of, you know, Oh, you're just ripping off Madonna. And so I think over time though, that people have really, you know, been able to kind of distinguish the fact that she is very respected. And I think it was probably after art pop, which wasn't necessarily a big success at the time. And I think that kind of gave her a little bit more freedom to do what she wanted and maybe come back and do some different things. And I think that helped her almost a little bit in hindsight, weirdly enough. Um, Because yeah, I think, and I think the fact that she's been able to branch out into acting and do so many different things is also kind of changed the perspective as well. Yeah. Andy and I sometimes, um, you know, are not always huge fans of like biopics and kind of Mm -hmm. films where, uh, you know, people are pretending to be musicians, that kind of thing. Um, You know, not really musicals like where people burst into song, but you know, that kind of film. But I I think we both agree that uh, the star is born um, remake is so good. Especially the first hour of that movie, I think is like as good as just like in terms of a performance as like just about anything I've seen in a long time. You know, like I just watched that kind of first hour over and over again. And she is so incredible. It, she really does kind of dissolve into that role. And on one level, you know, oh, this is Lady Gaga doing that. Okay. But at the same time, uh, you know, she is just so, she really inhabits that character so well. Um, you know, and so I, I would agree with that. And, you know, it's funny because I've never actually seen the beginning of that or the, the original. I mean, you know, I mean, there's been so many. I mean, there's been, that was like a remake of a remake of a remake. And I actually have never seen the original one. And, you know, but it was just, yeah, I mean, it was just really, 
uh, you know, I was so impressed by it when I finally did watch it because, you know, you hear about too, like, oh, she's great in it. She's great in everything. And you're like, all right, you know, Bradley Cooper, you know, is a, a musician. Sure. But then when you actually see it, you're like, wow, they really have chemistry and they really like, this is a really excellent rec- or movie. So I would agree with you. Mm-hmm. And it is kind of fun in this, in this documentary when she's like, she's like, oh, so I just um, signed to star in a movie that's being directed by Bradley Cooper. You know, it's like yeah, exactly. uh, this movie came out five years ago and it's like so much has happened with her in that period of time that it is kind of, I thought, I felt like the movie was more recent because I saw it when it came out and then I rewatched it again for this and I was like, whoa, like, oh yeah, this was like before the Oscar and before any of these, you know, other things that happened. So um, let's get into this Erg a Music War. So um, when Andy and I started this, uh, we were like, we are only doing documentaries. We are not doing concert films. <laughs> and, then, and then we like quickly realized that like that line was pretty blurry. Um, but this is probably the most concert film and l- at least talky of any film that we've done. So what, um, well, let's just kind of set the scene here. So uh, Ur- Erg, a music war directed by Derek Dur- Burbage uh, came out in, uh, I'm going to say two, uh, 1981, right around mm-hmm. then. Um, and um, Annie, you want to kind of just describe what this movie is? I mean, it's-, it's kind of like what you said. So it's interesting because there was a soundtrack and a, you know, movie documentary. And mm-hmm. it's basically the, the like the coolest bands of that time from like the U.S. and the U.K., um, you know, and nominally, I guess, punk bands, but not really, you know, because you have Gary Newman and OMD who are more synth oriented and you have Klaus Nomi, who's very kind of operatic and you have the Go-Go's who were kind of in their transition period between being punks to pop music, you know, and so there's just it's basically kind of a lot of underground bands at the time. And it's kind of anchored by the police um, because Miles Copeland who is, uh, it's Stuart Copeland's, I always have to double check, and, you know, who basically managed the police and founded IRS Records um, and is basically, you know, Stuart Copeland's brother. I had a big hand in it. And so what's also interesting is it's kind of a documentary on IRS Records, who was, you know, notorious in the 80s for having REM. REM is not on Erga Music War, but there's a lot of IRS Records artists on here. So it's almost kind of like a, uh, not like a calling card. It's almost like a promotion for them as well. So it's it's a really interesting kind of mishmash of things. And you're right. What's weird about it is that's basically just performances after performances after performances. And there's, you know, there's no talking heads. There's no interstitial, you know, you know, introduction of things. It's basically like, it's basically like MTV before MTV, like the coolest version of MTV you couldn't have pretty much. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically it. So can you tell me what your um like when you first saw this movie and what what you sort of uh if you if you if you know what you know the, to be the, like the story of its release or how people started to to see this um this movie I mean it like it's captivating it's a- absolutely fantastic yeah. you know it, it's intoxicating <laughs> to when you watch it um but I but I'm like fascinated to understand how people saw this in 1981 was this in like art houses would did you have to like find like your weird underground record shop or bookstore would do screenings you know do you, do you know anything about the backstory on this stuff so it's it's funny because i don't remember the last the first time i actually saw it because the more common way at least for me because i grew up in the 90s was getting the soundtrack first so mm. the soundtrack came out in 1981 as this double lp which is just like the greatest like punk post punk soundtrack so you pick it up and i think i got that before even seeing the movie and this was like in the 90s i think i found the vinyl you know soundtrack when no one cared about vinyl records and i was like oh this is totally great and so um you know i got that first but basically it kind of got a theatrical release but it was also just kind of it was this cult thing you know it was on Mm -hmm. cable it was on usa networks in the 80s and usa back then was not like it was now like if I remember correctly, USA had like a lot of game shows and had a lot of like, I don't know, like, you know, reruns of things there. So it was definitely yeah. kind of no like original a, programming. It was like no, one of those cable a, channels that would be like, whatever we can figure out the rights to is exactly. what's on USA. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, so that's 
So, you know, in my mind, I think I got a bootleg DVD of it at some point, like maybe in the early 2000s, because it was kind of released on like, you know, tape, but it was like very hard to find, like Laserdisc. It was like one of those things that was kind of, it was a cult classic because it was almost kind of lost. And like now, because it came out in like 1985 on video cassette. So like, good luck trying to find, you know, a copy of it. Um, you know, it's only kind of become a little bit more out there just because of, you know, the Internet Archive has a copy of it. And so which is, you know, I think a gray area in terms of copyright. Um, I think if I remember correctly, like at least for a while, if it was on YouTube, it would get shut down because of, you know, because of rights issues. Um, so because, yeah, it came out in like 2009 on DVD and I might have mm -hmm. bought it then because I was like, oh, my gosh, it's an actual like official release. But it was just, it's one of those things where with so many documentaries and so many things from the 80s is that the rights issues are just a nightmare because different bands are on different labels and, you know, different management companies and, and things like that. And so um, it's just difficult to kind of license and difficult to kind of clear. David, yeah, trademark yeah. lawyer, you're jumping out of your seat to get involved here. No, no, no. I'm not going to discuss it. There you go. Exactly. You understand <laughs> I'm that. off the you clock. You understand <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, this is not the intellectual property podcast. Which, um, so, um, okay, yeah, I mean, it, it is uh, so thrilling because you have all these young bands. I think there are 40 or somewhere around 40 artists in this two-hour movie. And it's like literally like one three-minute song after the other. Boom, boom, boom. There's no, you know, talking heads. There's like very, very, very little like of anything except for just the music, the music, the music, yeah. the title will quickly appear. Like here's XTC, here's the cramps, here's, you know, Devo. And then they're just going. And, and if you're just kind of following along, I mean, for me, there were some artists that I've never heard of. And then two minutes later, it's the Go-Go's or somebody that, you know, right. I'm very familiar with. So you get that. Yeah. It is kind of like watching MTV back in the day or something like that, or even just listening to the radio back in the day, um, where or like you know, attending you, a festival, you, you, like this is not yeah. a festival. These are all different shows, but it sort of has that vibe where you're like, Oh, I just finished seeing a band I know and I'm about to see a band I know, but I have 30 minutes in the middle here and I'll just go to the closest stage or whatever. Like, you know, where you're like, yeah. you, you pick up other bands, you know? So my first take after watching this movie was thinking like, Maybe people over 25 should be banned from making music because everybody in this documentary looks so cool. They have so much energy. Like they all like are just like discovering their creativity and blossoming. And, you know, obviously some of them became like the biggest stars in the world. Some of them, nobody, you know, knows who they are. But, um, you know, it, it's we love legacy artists here. And Andy and I go see a lot of bands that have been around for uh, centuries at this point it seems um but nonetheless and, and so no knock to people who've been doing this for a long time um uh, but nonetheless there you do get that uh that reminder of the like thrilling uh youthful excitement of people discovering a new style of music a new way of expressing themselves new ways of dressing and um y you know so even if that you know the 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 popularity of the quote unquote early 80s, you know, type music or post punk like may come and go. But I feel like for somebody watching this for the first time, it's it's always going to be thrilling just because of that energy. Well, and, you know, and at this point when they were filming all this stuff, too, this was when, you know, music video really hadn't kind of started to become music video like in the UK you know, music video had been a big part of the record industry for a half decade at this point, you know, starting with Queen and, you know, even well, well before that with Bowie. But in the U.S., people were still kind of trying to figure out, you know, how do we do music videos? You know, MTV didn't start until 1981. And so, you know, a lot of these, you know, kind of live clips were, you know, it was weird to have, you know, bands doing a music video at this point, you know, you know, live videos and, you know, and live sets, you know, were common, but a live video, like this was something a little bit different. And so this was definitely also kind of cutting edge on that sense. I mean, there were a lot of these bands that unless you were, you know, buying their records and looking at press photos or looking at magazines, you had no idea what they looked like. So you could get exposed to some of these bands who just look so cool and you know, dance so cool and dress so cool and sounded so cool. And you're like, wow, all right, this is pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So there was that element as well, especially if you were in America, because, you know, some of these bands have started coming over, but, you know, some of them not. I mean, I think Claus Nomi, of course, was on SNL with Bowie, but, you know, the, he was for a lot of people, they might not have any idea how he was and why this awesome dude looks so cool doing stuff. Right. And if you hadn't seen that episode of SNL that exactly. night, like, 
there's no way to probably, you know, catch up. Maybe somebody may have said like this weird, crazy looking German opera singer type guy, (laughs) you know, like it's hard to even describe him with it without reducing what he was doing. Um, And he's an interesting character in his own right. But yeah, I mean, if somebody had said, you know, the next day or, you know, Monday at work or school, like, hey, I saw this crazy guy playing with David Bowie, you know, it would just seem like a legend. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's that's exactly it. And I think, you know, it's almost hard for people to remember now that, you know, uh, even, you know, maybe during the 90s, there were some bands, you would have no idea what they looked like. They were these kind of mysteries. And especially back then, you know, a lot of these bands, like, you know, you just didn't kind of know what they were about. And so this might have been your first taste to kind of see you know, maybe you'd heard the name and some of the names are funny, you know, Echo and the Bunnymen. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. You know, orchestral movers in the dark. What? But, you know, actually seeing them, you know, in the flesh could be really, really transformative. So that gets to to my big take on this movie, which is it is such a uh, convincing case against how overly narrated most rock documentaries are. Because this movie tells a totally coherent story about this scene and these bands. And there's not somebody jumping in to like set the context and tell you like, Hey, you know, you got to keep in mind, no one was doing this back then. This was totally new. These guys were cutting new ground. Like you can just see it and you can go, Oh wow, that must've been totally new. These guys are cutting new ground. You know, like it doesn't need, you don't need somebody 30 years later to pipe in to explain it to you. And there are bands that are like from different subgenres, and that's obvious as well. No one needs to come and tell you like, well, you know, these things were related, but different, but you know, a lot of people ran in the same worlds and circles. And it's like, you just jump from one concert to the next in different locations. Yeah, I'm sure some of them were in the same locations, but for the most part, they're all, you know, you're, you're bouncing around and it, it almost has like a storytelling quality, like um, the film slacker or something where it's mm. like it you're you're just painting a picture of what it's like to be in the crowd of these shows to be in this world and it doesn't need to be explained it tell it it tells a, a perfectly coherent story about what is going on in this post-punk uh you know circuit basically i would agree with that and i think that's probably my biggest complaint with a lot of modern music documentaries is that they really kind of you know they do hit the narrative they hit you over the head with the narrative rather than kind of letting you watch it and then kind of draw your own conclusions they kind of lead you to the story more and lead you to this is what we want you know this is what we're going for and this is so great because you know you can watch this and you can get a sense of you know, this is what's going on. And there's no real kind of sanitizing of it either. It's not like, you know, there's no qualifications where you're saying, oh, you know, well, this band did this, but X, Y, Y, you know, they really did let the music speak for itself. Um, And I do feel like, and I think that's a really good point, because I do feel like a lot of documentaries that people are almost afraid to do that um, now. And I'm not sure why that is, you know, when, where this is, they knew that the music was strong enough and that there was enough of a story and there was enough of, you know, the, the, there was, there was so much good stuff they wanted to cram in there. They wanted to make sure they didn't want to kind of spoil it by putting these like interstitial things. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it does It really like now, I think it ages, it's, it aged a lot better than a lot of other things because then you can kind of put it on and you can just really kind of absorb everything and get a really good sense of what it was like in 1981 rather than maybe a retrospective look that might have some, you know, commentary and context and things like that. Yeah, I mean, and if it was made, if this was made in 2010, which, which with like that sort of retro retrospective look with commentary, like even just now, 10 years later, that retrospective look and commentary would be dated to 2010. You know, Absolutely. it would be, it would be a 2010s perspective on 1981 as opposed to now. I just get to see what it was like in 1981. <laughs> you know, I don't right. have to, I don't have to think about it. No, um, I love this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So since, um, since this documentary is just the, the concert f- footage and it doesn't have a narrative arc in the sense of, you know, a beginning, middle and end, like if it was a biographical, you know, type of documentary, I thought maybe we would just kind of like uh, share some moments or performances or, or um, you know, some of the musicians that like really kind of jump out. Like when you think about this movie, Annie, what mm-hmm. like, you know, or you're trying to tell somebody about it or say, oh, you got to see this. Like, what are some of the performances that really, um, you know, stick in your mind? 
I mean, one of the major ones is the fact that XTC is on there and XTC, um, I mean, they were a fabulous live band. They were just like really, you know, energetic and just kind of exciting and really, um, you know, just sounded really different, but they stopped touring after, and I think it was 82. I'd have to double check um, exactly, but they basically, um, their lead singer, Andy Partridge basically said, I can't do this anymore. And they stopped touring. And so, but they have this great footage of them and, you know, it really gives you a sense of, you know, what a great band they were live as well as in the studio. And so I think that for me, that's a big one. Um, also Gary Newman's performance um, because he was so far ahead of his time in terms of as a live performer. I mean, as, as a studio musician, because he used synthesizers and was just such a kind of a genius in terms of synthesizer based music, but especially live too. He had these, like, he had like a motorized like throne that he would like <laughs> on stage. Totally amazing. And like that stuff, that footage, you know, I've seen footage here and there online and like he had a concert film of, of his own, but like that stuff just really hard to find now too. And so the fact that they kind of captured that for one of his iconic songs down in the park just makes me really happy as well. Um, just because that's just like, it just shows off like how brilliant he was. And then, you know, and this is a band I think that's pretty well documented, but just seeing the police at this era too, you know, people, you know, by the time, you know, people might think of, you know, synchronicity and just how, you know, what a huge band they were and things like that. But this really kind of shows off their more kind of wiry side and, you know, how they combined reggae and dub and punk music in really interesting ways. So they're really kind of um, and appropriately, I guess, because, you know, Stuart's brother was involved in it. They really kind of turned things up a notch for this too. Yeah. I mean, with the, the police, it's like, it's sort of hard to shake yourself and not see them as like some of the most famous musicians in the world but this yeah. movie does it for you right it's like it, it allows you to transport and see why they were why they became what they became you know absolutely um one that stands out to me just because uh and i think the inclusion of the police it makes it sensible but it's just interesting as a historical artifact that steel pulse would have been yeah. um thought of in the company of these other bands um and their performance is, is is great yeah um and you know very understated with the kkk hood uh that <laughs> was uh was uh, it's shocking um but but uh they really stand out to me also I'll, i will say xcc because uh i sheepishly must admit that i was not familiar with that band before seeing this movie and their performance is absolutely incredible xcc is awesome um and yeah you do think of them at least i do as more like studio rat type of band yeah. um especially with some of the later stuff so um seeing them as that kind of thriving live performer is so cool um yeah i mean i the 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 film opens with the police doing driven to tears um sting's wearing a t-shirt for the band the beat which we know is the english beat um and, but um i i do think you kind of see uh why they are you know became the biggest band in the world shortly after this and why they, you know, probably are still the most famous of any of the bands that are featured here. I mean, even though some of them became super popular um, because they're, they're so incredibly good. <laughs> um, and it, it, it does kind of like, I mean, no slap to wall of voodoo who comes on next. Uh, their performance is great. Um, but it does kind of feel like, okay, we're taking a little bit of a step down, um, you know, meaning like it, it feels like you're seeing the opener of an, of a concert and then the, close you know what i mean like um right after the right after the main band but um uh a couple that kind of jumped out to me like orchestral maneuvers in the dark omd um i saw the band parquet courts uh, a couple months ago yeah. and i mean it, it like it, it it the entire vo everything that or omd is doing is what parquet courts is doing and i don't think i'd ever really made that i know you know they're influenced by that kind of music yeah. um but like the visual presentation and everything is exact. Like it, like the concert that I saw a few months ago, I may as well have been seeing almost OMD um, because it was, you know, it, when I watched this, I was like, Oh, that's exactly the same thing, which is not a slam on parquet courts. Of course. It's just like everybody's influenced by somebody, but it is a very specific influence, but that, um, that really came through in terms of making this movie not seem just like something that happened 40 years ago, but also like still relevant to, you know, a pretty big sold out concert that I saw, you know, this year um 
Let's see, what are a few others? Well, we had uh, the Go-Go's, so we had Jane Weedland's uh, second oh, Rock Docs performance because she's in the Sparks documentary, which yeah. we just love so much. Anytime anybody from that documentary shows up in something else, I'm like, oh yeah, Sparks, like there you go. We got a little connection there. But the, the Go-Go's in this are incredible. I mean, like an absolutely riveting performance. So good. And that, and absolutely. And, you know, and I should have mentioned them as well in just because, yeah. you know, they were just such a great scrappy live band and just really, mm -hmm. you know, everybody in the band brought different kind of skills and backgrounds to the table and they just, it just really came together. I mean, we got the beat as one of the great singles of the eighties. You can really see how it is there. And it's so great because it works as a glossy pop song, but it also works as kind of a punkish, you know, rave up too. And so, you know, it really shows, and I mean, I think that's the sign of a good song is that it can work in so many different directions, depending on what you want to do. Um, also mentioned here, David, uh, Gang of Four. Did we, did it, has anybody mentioned Gang of Four yet? No. We should have, because they're just um, amazing. They're so good. And they're, they're almost at the end of this. So it's like, after two hours, you're like, whoa, you're kind of punchy. And then they just come in and take it up yeah. to another level. Well, and so like, I don't think anybody would necessarily think of the bands in this scene as uh uh similar to the uh, my favorite band fish but what gang of four is doing here is like quintessential 1997 fish cow funk as we call it it is you, th this you, is what you they had do to do it okay i'm sorry that's that is what <laughs> when people say like what is cow funk what what is what do fish fans mean when they say that it's what gang of four is doing here um and You're gonna get a lot of hate mail from Gang of Four fans who are going to be very <laughs> upset that you compare them to Fish. And I like Fish. I, but bring we it have on. done about we've done about fifty episodes on different bands that I've compared to Fish, and and it <laughs> has and it hasn't pleased anyone yet. So, <laughs> so I'm just least gonna, of all me. <laughs> that that's your bonus episode is a super cut of all those together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. All right, Andy, make your case. No, I mean it's, it's like this this uh, restrained. Uh, you know, down tempo beat that they just fall into a pocket and sit in it. And it is such a groove. It is so good. Um, it's soulful and, it, but, and then, but like somehow energetic, even though it's not up tempo at all. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I could listen to that performance for uh, 30 minutes, which is, which is what fish would have done with it. But, uh, <laughs> but the, but the sound Therein the lies sound. the problem. Yeah. <laughs> But no, the sound is 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 fantastic, and it it catches me it catches me off guard. But then, um, man, it works so well. Okay, I don't even know how to respond to that, Annie. <laughs> I I got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, it's just like right. sparse and restrained. The basis is leading everything. It's great. It's fantastic. Okay, I never see the I never see when this is about to happen. Uh, <laughs> so. It's fine. You Somehow. like a photo bomb? Only it's a fish bomb. Mm -hmm. somehow i get caught off guard every time okay so um all right so again uh getting back to our sopranos connection andy I, I think you'll know what's coming but one of the early performances in this is um john cooper clark who um is a very interesting character he his performance in this movie is he's a poet and he's on stage wearing his like super cool suit with his super cool rock and roll hair yeah. um british you know in his in his sort of working class british accent reciting this poem um about a, a health fanatic um he doesn't the uh, john cooper clark himself does not appear to be perhaps the most healthy person in the world when he's reciting this um but um there's no musical backing and it's not like he's rapping or doing something like that he's just reciting the poem in a sort of rhythm with his own to his own internal clock and beat and it works like it is still a rock performance yeah. just as much as like anybody who's playing guitar bass and drums you know in this movie um and the reason i know him is because his uh his another kind of song slash poem that he does is uh called evidently chicken town um and that appears in a very crucial scene um, in the Sopranos, which is uh, a baptism. So it all kind of ties together. But um, for those of you who uh, remember that one weird scene uh, or, or the baptism scene of Christopher's kid where there's that kind of British guy uh, talk chanting uh, over it um, and you enjoyed that, uh, go check this out because John Cooper Clark, seeing, you know, this is the first time I've really seen him perform like live. I never really looked up any video or anything. And it's like, 
what is the deal with this guy? He's amazing. Yeah. You know, nobody copied. There's no like, okay, like, yeah, OMD. Like I saw a band recently that was doing the same kind of thing they were doing, you know, 40 years later. But there's no John Cooper Clarks out there. He is totally, uh, there's only one. Mm-hmm. Um, so change gears for a second. I wonder, I feel like the the style of music here complements so well what the movie's trying to do with these quick cuts and jumping between bands um, and the sound of the, you know, the, what the, what the actual bands featured here sound like, I think that that marries really well. I think if you tried to do this movie with like, I don't know, like standard radio classic rock and you're just like, Whoa, here's, here's 25 bands who were huge in 1975. Like here's the Eagles, Eagles and here's Crosby, Stills and Nash. And you were just going to quick cut between them, but each of them were going to be like seven minute lackadaisical yeah. <laughs> song. It would like not work. It, it, it's the it's the combination of the sound of the of the bands that lends itself to to the fast moving pace of the film. I would agree with that, and I think that's another really good point. And I mean, you know, I think we got so used to that when MTV became, yeah, you know, so popular because the quick cut video thing you know, that became a style and, you know, the quicker, the better, but, you know, but there was the, all of this music was so urgent and it was so, you know, jittery and just so, you know, so fast that, you know, that it made sense to kind of jump from thing to thing because it, it but, the, but yet all of the films and all the, 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 the songs themselves, you know, you get the whole experience. Like, it's not like it's so, you know, frenetic that you can't necessarily get a sense of what it is. Um, but the fact that they do and, you know, and really, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, how all this is put together, the sequencing is actually really good. And I mean, these are all bands yeah. that, you know, some of them sound similar, but a lot of them are all very distinct. And the way this is kind of, uh, you know, basically like for better, for worse, like sequence, like a double record is really good. Like it works. It's not like it's ever so jarring that you're like getting whiplash from kind of how things are going, you know, back and forth. Um, even like Dead Kennedys and the Steel Pulse and the Gary Newman, like for some reason it works. So there was a lot of mm -hmm. care taken with that as well. You could tell. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it you know, it, it's not like any other um, concert film I can think mm -hmm. of. You know, there's other you know, there's festival movies, you know, there's That's... Woodstock, uh, Summer of Soul, what you know, which is, uh, you know, has its own kind of twist on it. But, you know, there's plenty of, of of movies that are a documentary of some kind of festival, a punk festival, this, that and the other. So you, so it's not the only thing where you're going to see a whole bunch of different artists. But, yeah, it really is. Like you said, Annie, I hadn't thought of it that way, but it really is sequenced like an album where it does flow together really well, um, where you just can't really describe it and say like, well, it works because of X. It just really flows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying to think if there is a, like any other touch point to compare this movie to, whether it would be, um, you know, like, y yes, there's festival movies that would that are similar, but but different in an important way. This is like about a, a whole scene. It's in different cities. It's it's not the same as a festival, really. Um, I could imagine, you know, something about like a particular venue if you wanted to like make us tell a story about like i don't know I, I know there's a fictional movie about cbgb that's like not good at all but like a documentary version of that i could imagine um but like i i'm trying to think of anything that's just like this just just a, a series of performances from different places that are loosely held together by being broadly in the same scene yeah and it, well i think this works because you get it was intended to be what it is. So it's not like something where you're trying to patch together different footage from different artists to make it happen. You know what I mean? Like there might yeah. be enough footage of, you know, the early punk New York city punk bands from the late seventies where you get a television performance and the, you know, Patty Smith, whatever, but they're not going to look the same because they weren't intended to be all film, you know, part of the same movie here. Mm -hmm. Like you get mm -hmm. a consistency across filming style, the audio quality and everything else that, that, you know, kind of helps to smooth those transitions. I think a little bit, I don't know, unless we're not thinking of something, but it's, um, it, Annie, thank you for like introducing this to us because it's so cool. I'm so glad. I mean, I, I mean, that's what, you know, it's, it's such a unique thing. And I feel like, you know, if, if you know about ERG, you know, but I feel like it's also a little <laughs> bit overlooked in a sense when people, because I think it was so hard to find and it still is kind of hard mm -hmm. to find, you know, it's not like, 
it didn't turn into one of those movies that, you know, plays once a year, like, you know, your art house theater or, you know, gets streamed on, you know, on different stations, you know, on, on random channels. Like you really have to kind of seek it out. You really have to kind of, you know, know where it exists. And so there's kind of that mystery about it. And I think that's why it also, you know, why it's so special too. I have, we, I've been with David while this has happened. So I, I know he's had the same experience. We've, we brought this up to people who are into music documentaries and, um, uh, you know, granted, I'm self-selecting people who I, th- I think might know it, um, but the reaction has universally been like some version of, what "Are you? Yeah, you didn't know the best movie ever. What is the matter with you? <laughs> like, finally, you you have a podcast about music documentaries, and you're just now learning about Erg and Music War. Um, so, you know, I've uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad to have finally joined. But it, this movie really does seem to have, um, like, become embraced by a, a, a lot lots of people like i talked to somebody who said that like this was the what they used to watch in college when they were like getting ready to go hang go out for the night that this was like this was their their like hanging out movie um i talked to somebody else who said that they got a copy of it early on in the pandemic and they just watched it over and over again when they were wow. stuck in their house <laughs> um it's like you know like there's this movie has a real like life of its own among among people who know about it and I think there is something just really comforting about it, too. You know, you mm-hmm. can watch it over and over again. And, you know, every band, the performances they chose and the songs they chose are all really good, too. You know, and so you have the stuff that's familiar that you've heard a lot. And there's also kind of the stuff you may have forgotten about. And so there really is just, you know, it, it is one of those things. And you can come into it like you can, you know, watch half of it, put it aside, come back to it. And then, you know, it's just as good. You don't need to necessarily start at the beginning. So it's just, and it's just the quality is also really good. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, uh, if you haven't seen it, there's definitely a, there'll probably be people that you're familiar with. And there's definitely going to be some artists that you're going to be like writing this down or, or looking them up on Spotify or wherever, because you're going to go deep on somebody. Like something's going to catch your eye. Even, you know, if you watch it multiple times where you're like, yeah, I never really listened to, you know, them before and just go and discover the cramps or, you know, Gary Newman, like you said, or something really? magazine or whoever. And, um, you know, it, it's a great sort of introduction for, for people who uh, are not familiar with a hundred percent of these bands, which is nearly everybody. So, <laughs> um super cool so yeah annie we always ask and i this is not there's gonna be no suspense here whatsoever but we always ask at the uh at the end when we're discussing a movie um for somebody who's not you know doesn't already know about this isn't particularly a fan of these bands or or know that much about the scene would you recommend this just as a movie to watch just as they're you know somebody an an enjoyable evening for somebody i think we know where it's gonna go but i'll let you answer 100 percent, absolutely Andy, any yeah, reservations yeah. on this one? Yeah, make it two for two so far. I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll be angry if we don't hit th- hit three for three. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, obviously. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you have any interest whatsoever in punk, post punk, '80s music, anything like that, uh, any of the, you know, any of these bands ring a bell to you, and you and you kind of like are like, okay, maybe I would like somebody in that style. Um, then this is go- you're going to be really stoked that you uh, that you found it, and you can, you know. Thank Andy for introducing uh, indirectly uh, to, uh, to to this uh, to this super awesome movie. Um, we we were able I was able to watch it on Vimeo right now. Andy, like you said, it, the rights kind of bounce around, so you might find it on YouTube or on um, I don't know some uh, dark we web or something I don't on know. on the archive, right? Yeah, yeah internet, internet archive. I, I found it on the internet archive, and I honestly I have not checked to like how much DVDs go for, just because you know DVDs go out of print so quickly. So, because like I, you don't necessarily, it looks like you can get it pretty easily on Amazon, weirdly enough, which is interesting because I feel like that for a while it was almost like really, really difficult to find. Um, But it seems like you can actually get it now, which is really cool because yeah, like for a while, like you had to get bootlegs or it would be really expensive because it was out of print. But it also seems like if you want your own copy, it's actually pretty reasonable to get now, which is very cool. Also great title, Erg, A Music War. Come on. If you like, if that's not interesting to you, like just keep walking. I don't know. Exactly. (laughs) Um, all right. Well, this is super fun. Annie, thank you so much. Uh, I didn't even mention, um, a, a year or two ago, you you did a 33 and a third book on Duran Duran, How You yeah, Like the Wolf. Yeah, it was just was last it? year, weirdly enough. Yeah, so a 33 and a third on Duran Duran. And I have, um, I actually have a reissue of that coming out as well in December. 
um, which is a special limited edition with new goodies and pictures and things like that. So that's also coming right. as well. Rio, Rio, the Hungry Like the Wolf is a song, of course. Absolutely. Rio's a, yeah, that's a really good book. I'm obsessed with the 33 and a third uh, collection, so that would be probably a whole other conversation about that and about Duran Duran, who are also super cool. Uh, and um, I, I don't think, is there like, there's not a Duran Duran documentary, is there? Well, it's, you know, it depends on what, so they have their concert documentaries from the 80s. Um, there's a couple of them. Um, they, they, there's like different versions of them. They had kind of an hour long documentary um, that ran in the UK a couple of years ago. And I think it ran on PBS here. So they have, they, David Lynch did a concert film like with them. So they have a bunch of different stuff. Like you could probably do a really good okay. episode, an omnibus episode of Duran Duran's kind of video output because there's, there's a lot of it, but it, there's just like, like with anything, their band has a lot of variations on things. So, you know, this came out in the eighties and you can't get it now, but there's a version that ran on TV versus you know, what was actually released commercially. And so, um, yeah, I could bore you probably for hours with that, but I I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I have to go to go uh, get a copy of David Lynch doing a Duran Duran movie right now. Oh, right. I, ha- I have to go it's right live, now. It's a live concert performance. They, I believe yeah. they premiered it on YouTube because I watched it live. This was years ago and oh, yeah. it was very cool. They had a kind of all this, like it was very noir, of course. And they had special guests like Gerard Way from My Chemical Romance came, sort of Beth Ditto from gossip and so it was it was really really cool so i think there's footage of that floating around on youtube um and the whole thing might even be up there but that that screens every so often as well um i think it's screened maybe in chicago this year potentially so Very that cool. that does stream here and there okay we may need to drag you back on here for a duran duran day <laughs> one of these days <laughs> anytime because that's anytime. a whole other about the music but the videos that's I, I would have to sit down and do my research and to make sure i get my story straight but there's a lot of them well andy and i rarely do our research or get our story straight so it wouldn't be <laughs> <laughs> the, the standards are pretty low okay andy did we do it we did it this is great <laughs> awesome well, thank you so much andy uh oh and where can people find you uh, andy zaleski z-a-l-e-s-k-i on twitter Anything yeah, else you Twitter's want to plug? probably easiest. That's where I'm, I tend to be most. Um, you know, I'm on Instagram as Annie Zaleski author, and then you know, Facebook I don't use quite as much, but I'm there. All right. Well, people buy her books because books are good, and we want people to keep writing them. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for having us on to talk about Lady Gaga, Erg, and many other things. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks awesome. Okay. Me. Well, this this was uh, Rock Docs. Oh, yeah. We're at Rock Docs Pod on Twitter, and uh, you can come and holler at us there. Awesome. Uh, thanks for listening to Rock Docs. Mm-hmm.